increase relations throughout the United States. Lynn Blinkenberg. Thank you so much. So first of all, we have to listen. We have to make sure that we listen with the intent to learn. Every person wants to be heard. I do not support writing, but I do support our First Amendment right to, to assemble. And uh, that's something I've worn a uniform for for 34 years, so people have the right to assemble. But there's a difference between peaceful protesting and rioting. And rioting falls under, under criminal activity, whether it's uh, looting, whether it's um, arson. And we are a land of laws, and, and folks who, who commit criminal acts should be held accountable for those criminal acts. Um, so. Uh, Definitely, you know, the intent to learn as we listen. I'm very fortunate in my job in the United States Navy. I am the command equal opportunity uh, manager for our command. And so we have conversations all the time. And these are very easy and effective conversations to have. And we as a Congress need to set the example and lead by that example. And so um, by opening that dialogue, having respectful conversations about it, you know, when I hear folks who are black and are in the military, when they say they want to be heard, they, they want to be identified as people who are fe feeling the injustice that we've seen, such as in the George Floyd um, event. But um, they are not criminals, and they don't want to be identified with cr as criminals as such. So, um, you know, that, that's very important to keep the dialogue and the discussion going. I think Martin Luther King did a really great job as he got the discussions going in this country. I, do, I don't support defunding the police. We need our police, and we need to continue with a strong police force, and so I don't support defending the police, and I don't support taking away our history either. Lynn Blankenbecker, thank you. Steve Negger? Absolutely. We've all seen the George Floyd video and the subsequent rioting, mayhem, the establishment of autonomous zones, and the destruction of statues across the country. How can we support the black community, support local law enforcement, and improve race relations throughout the United States? Thank you. Well, being the only Hispanic and being the only minority in this race, you know, these things touch close to home. You know, I have myself been exposed to some of these things, and while George Floyd's death was tragic, it's not an indictment against an institution. You know, I've been asked the question about what is this cultural racism. Look, there's bad people everywhere. There's bad people that are gonna do things to, to other, other people, but that's not the issue. The issue is, do we learn from those things that happen, right? When I was in the service, we had things called TTPs, turning, training techniques and procedures. We're always compelled to evaluate what we're doing and make sure that we get better. Look, the thing that we need to realize is that we have a Congresswoman, Ann Custer, that through all the stuff that's happening, not once, not once has she condemned any of the activities that are out there. That's telling about the woman who's supposed to be representing us. And that's important for us to realize. Look, there were things that I was not be able to, what I was not able to do because I was Hispanic, right? I didn't become a victim. I got stronger for it. And I realized that, you know what? I'm responsible for my own self. Those things that happen out there, are they wrong? Absolutely. Can we be better? Absolutely. Remember, this country was founded on an idea. And remember, we say that all, all men are created equal. All of them. I don't need certain situations for me to start bringing that up as a topic. The, the left, they're not even a Democratic Party anymore, but the radical left have all these cans of Tannerite all over the country. They're just looking for reasons to see what we have in Portland, in Seattle, and what we just saw in Wisconsin. What we need is people that understand that need to defend, not defund the police, unlike Ann Custer, make sure that we're doing everything possible to make our neighborhood safe, and that's what I intend to do when I get to Congress. Thank you. Steve Nagrin, thank you. Um, I would like to ask a follow-up question to all of the candidates, and we'll just go in the same order. One of the terms that's being thrown around a lot in the context of George Floyd, the rioting, the autonomous zones, the destruction of statues, the cancel culture that we have, is the term called institutional or systemic racism. When you hear that term, what comes to mind? What are they saying when they say institutional or systemic racism? Elon. Okay, I do want to say great idea, Steve. It's a lot better being able to stand up some solid foundation, just like we need to ensure that we have a solid foundation for the youth of America to learn the freedom values that we Republicans hold dear. So when it comes to institutional racism, the problem with that is America is founded on the principles of equal opportunity. It is not really possible to have equal opportunity if we are also looking to have equity where the government is the one to decide what is equal and what is not. 
So while it is important to be sure we promote equal opportunity for people, we do need to also ensure that we are not sacrificing our American values by having the government themselves decide what makes us all equal. That is the only way to ensure that we have a just and fair society here in the United States. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Tessa, I reject the premise of systemic racism. A racist country is, America is not a racist country. I don't believe there is systemic racism, because if this were a racist country, we would have never elected a black man president once, let alone twice. Um, I believe that <clears throat> when you talk about things that are unfair, I think it comes down to economics. I believe that people, when they become dependent on the government, they lose their they lose their economic progress going forward. When you have uh, when you have groups that are become dependent on government handouts that are constantly told you need this, you need this, they they pigeonhole themselves and and it prevents them from actually succeeding and taking part in the American dream. So I reject the notion of systemic racism. I do not believe we're a racist country, and I think it's a false narrative, and I think it's a dangerous narrative. Thank you. Do you guys mind if I sit so I don't jump up and down on my heels in this sand? <laughs> Talk about an injustice. Um, oh my goodness. No. So, um, so, can you repeat the question, please? The question was, you, in, in the context of the George Floyd videos, the rioting, the autonomous zones, you hear the radical left in this country talking about systemic or institutional racism. When you hear that term, what do you think of, and what do you think they're referring to? Thanks. So I'd like to believe that there isn't systemic racism in this country, but I'm going to tell you, we're talking to 645 members of my command in the United States Navy during our enduring conversations, they will tell you that they feel like that there is still racism in this country, and that's a problem, and we need to fix it. And so um, whether you know, it's a perception of what we think of a particular culture or a particular race or whether, you know, we have a preconceived notion. Again, it's an opportunity for us to take the time to listen and learn and learn about those other cultures and learn about what it is that they feel. I'll tell you, I was uh, speaking with the Congolese stu uh, students the other day who were uh, getting ready to drive and they said they were afraid that police officers were going to hurt them in their cars when they were learning to drive. And I said, has that ever happened in Concord? And they said, no but that that is something that that is shared amongst their their peers and so there is a there is a true systemic racism in this nation um, whether it's a perception or a particular culture that feels it and we just need to make sure that we have the conversation to write that Lynn, thank you Steve no there isn't no there isn't and I have this question asked me all the time and I put it back to him I said what's your definition of systemic racism what does that mean to you Look, this is 2020. When I finish a conversation with somebody that I'm trying to talk to about systemic racism, I ask them, are we better today? We're not perfect, but are we better today than we were in 1960? Are we better today than we were in 1970? I lived through the 60s. I remember 1968. Martin Luther King was assassinated. Bobby Kennedy was assassinated. We had race riots. We are better. I'm standing before you as a congressional candidate that I don't think I could have done in 1970, or 1960, or 1950, as a Hispanic. We have gotten better. Is there room to improve? Absolutely, and we should. We should never settle for where we're at. But this is a narrative that the left wants is because it's a talking point that gets people emotional. And we need to be factual. Let's not jump the gun. Let's figure out what the, thing is, the things are that we can fix. Let's fix those. But let us not go down the rabbit hole and have this emotional argument with the left about the systemic racism. We're not perfect, but we're a whole hell of a lot better than we were than 30 years ago. Thank you, Steve. All right, see, we warmed up. We got a, we got a, we're off to a great start here. Get the tough questions out of the way. Eli, what do you see as the 